rather lengthy reading tonight, so you don't have to stand if you don't want to, or if you want to stand and sit in the middle, it's fine. We're going to be reading the entire chapter of Revelation, chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old servant, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive, that he should, that he should deceive the nations no more. So a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image neither had received his mark upon his forehead, on their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests, of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations, nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, God and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil hath deceived them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want to preach, talk to you on this thought tonight, the truth about hell. As a preacher, I'm often confronted with death, and one thing I've observed in the many funerals that I've had to do, or uh, for the family I had a privilege to do for them, I've observed that, is that when someone dies, that the person's loved ones and their friends want to believe their relative or friend went to a better place. And we will say things like she was a religious person. She wasn't a religious person, but, but deep down, she had a good heart. Or he wasn't a saint, but he did do some good things. And when it comes to death and eternity, it's human nature for us to hope for the best for our friends and for our loved ones instead of contemplating, instead of worrying about, thinking about the worst. But research, research shows that while almost three out of four people believe in heaven, less than half believe in hell. Think about 
about the uh, the problem. Think about the ramifications here. Uh, if hell didn't exist, unbelievers would, would easily reject Christ with no fear of God whatsoever. And believers would be, we would be very uh, unmotivated to share Christ with others. And while I'm sure here tonight that I don't have to convince uh, any of you or most of you that there is an existence of hell, I want to talk to us tonight about hell so as to motivate us to do whatever it takes, whatever we have to do in order to keep someone from going to hell. There are many different beliefs about it. Some say it's a grave. Some say it's it's only for the devil. Some teach that it's here on earth. And some say that it's a, an outer darkness that, that we just float out, out there away from God. And in all these ideas of hell, there is a little bit of truth in each one of them. Uh, it is a place where God is not, but we all know that half-truth is still alive. Amen. People are, are reluctant to think about judgment and punishment. People like to think of God's blessings in heaven. And because of this, Satan fools us into many schemes to, to, to stop us from thinking and to stop us from talking uh, and taking seriously the punishment of not obeying God. You see, the reason why we see some of these churches filled to capacity is Brother Menavilla, they don't preach messages like this. Amen. Sister Lou just spoke or just sung a few moments ago the beautiful city of gold. Amen. That's what everybody wants to hear. You know, we, I mean, I've I seen some of you pray. I mean, you, 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 you started thinking that mine, it may have been a little rusty, but it started spinning a little bit because you started thinking about all the beautiful things that's going to be there yeah, and how great it's going to be. Yes, but that's what we all want to hear. And I, I mean, don't we all want to hear about the city of gold? I mean, how many can really, truly raise their hand tonight and honestly say, tell me about hell? None of us really want to be taught about hell, but you know, that is more, that is just as important or more important to be taught about hell than it is in heaven. The reality of hell has been, has been uh, undermined in our society, and we've, we've seen that over the past few years, and, and we've seen that more and more this very year. That, that, that hell is really just another uh, just another word that people throw out there to scare people. Jesus, Jesus. But it's not a scare tactic. No, it's reality. Yeah. And the truth about hell is, is that we don't live for God and live according to his word. We will go to hell. That's right. You know, we've all heard jokes about hell. Some of these, you know, we... we We've heard them and we've smirked about them and we kind of laughed a little bit, but you know, we've, we've all heard the jokes about hell. The salesman who was so good, he could sell air conditioners to the devil. Or, or the man who was so happy to be in hell because at last he could have peace and quiet from his wife. This is how, how lightly people, society today, take hell. At Willie Nelson's birthday past several years ago, Aerosmith's lead singer Steven Tyler, anybody know who I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. I do. Yeah. Said, Happy birthday, Willie. Here's hoping that we will have twice as much fun in hell as we did on earth trying to get there. Jesus. We don't take it serious. And, and sadly to say, the young people of today do not take it seriously. I was young. I lived my teenage years, and I'm going to tell you now, even though I knew the truth, even though I preached my first message when I was 13 years old, Brother Perry, even though I did those things, and I was raised in a, in a Pentecostal church. I was, I, I mean, I, as a baby in cloth diapers, I was laid underneath a wooden slatted pew while people just shouted all over the place. I knew all these things, 
But did I take hell seriously? No, I did not. Because if I took it seriously, I wouldn't have got out and done those things that I did. I wouldn't have got out and got swung out on drugs. I wouldn't have got out. I wouldn't have spent not one night behind bars. If I took hell seriously. It wouldn't have come down to the point of somebody actually standing out and sticking up for me and opening my eyes and making me realize that I had one more chance. We fail to take hell seriously. And as young people, we worried about her or we worried about him. We worried about, well, I need to hold her hand or I need to hold his hand. We worried about, well, if I'm in church with her and if I start raising my hands, is, is she going to think something's wrong with me? This is what we worry about as teenagers. I know I was there. But it's time, young people, that we start taking seriously not only the songs about heaven, but we start taking seriously the word of God about the reality and the truth of hell. Is any of us perfect? No. Because if I was perfect, I'd have woke up on the other side of the gates of heaven this morning. Amen. But we've got to take seriously. We've got to take it serious. It's not a as, as was mentioned this morning, it's not time to play church. It's time to stop playing church. It's time to stop coming to church and saying, oh, I made it there. That's all that counts. No, that's not all that counts. Let me bust your ball. The Satan, Satan does not care if we had a revival here that went 30 days straight. He wouldn't care one bit if you made it to every single night to, as long as you didn't make an effort to, to get closer to God. As long as you didn't make an effort to pray and worship, you can go to church all you want to. Let me tell you something else. The devil is more faithful to church attendance than most of us that are sitting in here tonight. That's true. Because the devil goes to church. A few years ago, Adam Sandler made a movie called Little Nicky. It was about the dumb son of Satan that tried to serve his dad. Some believe hell is going to be a party. Some believe that they will not be alone. Yet in all these ideas, the Bible claims loud and clear what hell really is. Like I said, this is not a scare tactic, but, but this morning's service really got me thinking. And, and, and Sister Jennifer, the book, I long you, some of these ideas, some of these thoughts came from the book, The Christian Atheists. I mean, are we really Christians? And in today's time, you've heard this what happened this past week in Oregon. The man asked the person, are you a Christian? They said, yeah, he gone to hell. It's not across the big pond anymore, church. It's right here in our backyard. And that's what I'm saying. It's time that we take seriously the facts and the truth that the Bible lays out to us about a hell that, we, that was not created for you and me. It was created for the devil and his angels. But if we fail to live in the word of God, that's where we will spend eternity. Just like it was mentioned this morning. If we just stand here and just gaze at the pearly gates. If we just stand here and gaze at the streets of gold. That's all we'll ever do. We'll never be able to walk on them. We'll never be able to shake hands with the man that saved us. Here's some horrors of hell. And it's not Brother Stewart saying it. It's God saying it out of his word. Revelation 20 and 15 tells us it's a lake of fire. It's a huge raging fire. People in it that never burn up. But the pain will be forever. Revelation 20 and verse 1 tells us it's an abyss. It's a pit. You're falling fear, awful fear there. It tells us in Matthew 8 and 12 that it's a place of weeping. You'll be crying because of the pain and the fear and even the memories of where you could be. I want to believe that, and I want to believe that if you're if someone is in hell tonight and they've walked in this church before and they refuse to come down to an altar, they refuse to give in to the word of God. I want to believe tonight that perhaps they're in hell tonight thinking about that service. Oh, I just sat there in a pew, I just sat there in a chair, and all I done was gaze at the altar. All I done was gaze at God. All I done was gaze at the Place of gnashing of teeth. 
Matthew 13 tells us that it's a furnace of fire. It's hot. It's, it, it's lava hot. It's even hotter than that. Revelation 14 tells us that it's a place that will there be no rest. No sleep ever. No rest from pain. Matthew 25 says it's a place of everlasting punishment. Jude tells us that it's a place of darkness. Matthew 25 tells us again that it's a place for the devil and his angels and his followers, if you would. It's a place where there will be tormenting, burning, suffering, the smell, the pain. Have you ever been into a burn unit and you, you, and you smelt someone that their, their, their skin was burnt? And you smell that horrific smell? Don't be fooled by somebody telling you that you won't smell anything, that you won't feel anything, that it is just an outer darkness. Yes, it is an outer darkness, but it's an outer darkness that's going to be full with torment, with pain, with suffering, with burning. Imagine how it feels when you touch, if you have an electric stove and you put your finger on that burner. It hurts, and it hurts for a long time. Imagine that is nothing compared to the burning, the pain, the suffering, the agony that we will have when we're in hell. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Mark 9 tells us it's a fire. And it's not going to be put out. There will, there will rain fiery coals on the people and the devil. It tells us in Revelation 11, Psalms 140, burning coals falls upon them like a volcano that's erupted and the lava and the rocks are exploding on the people. You never get used to it. When you burn your finger after a while, you get used to it. Oh, it's just there now. A little aggravating, a little agitating later on, but not this kind of fire. Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's a place of torment in Luke. Jesus, Jesus. It's a place without the slightest bit of release or even the hope of release. And Mark can tell us that it's a place where the worm does not die. Fire burning. Worms eating at your flesh. Brother Stewart, stop! Tell me about the streets of gold. Tell me about the mansion that's waiting for me. It is, it's still there. It's waiting for you. If you would avoid hell. No mercy there. No hope there. No love. You think you have fear now. You're talking about unimaginable fear that never, ever, ever ends. You think you might have depression here on earth, and I go through it just like everybody else sometimes. I've been through it. You think you have depression here on this earth. Think of never ending depression. Hell is real in the most awful, horrible place anywhere. Think of the worst place that you could possibly go into here on this earth. It's a mansion compared to hell. Maurice Rawlings, a cardiologist and a professor of medicine at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine. He was a devout atheist. But in 1977, while trying to resuscitate a man who had been screaming in terror, something happened that changed his thinking. And he gave this report to Omni Magazine. He said each time he regained heartbeat and respiration, the patient screamed. I am in hell. Oh, mm. He was terrified and pleading with, with me to help him. I was scared to death, said Mr. Rawlings. Then I noticed a real alarmed look on his face. He had a terrified look 
worse than the ex any expression that I've ever seen. Worse than the expression of death itself. This patient had a grotesque grimace expression of sheer horror. His pupils were dilated and he was perspiring and trembling. He looked as if the roots of his hair was on fire. Then still, another strange thing happened, Mr. Rowling said. This man said, don't you understand? I am in hell. Don't let me go back to hell. The man was serious and in a very serious condition and it finally occurred to me, Mr. Rowling said, that he was indeed in trouble. He was in a panic like I've never seen before. But Dr. Rowling said, no one who could have ever heard this, his screams and saw the look of terror on his face could doubt for a single moment that he was actually in a place called hell. If we truly understood what hell was like, we'd be more motivated in reaching the lost souls. Because hell is a place of unspeakable suffering. Let me tell you how bad it is. Jesus says in Matthew 5 and 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. I know it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown in hell. Amen. I mean, can you imagine gouging out your own eye? Can you imagine the pain? But yet, according to Jesus himself, as horrible as it can be, digging your own eye out would be far better than that punishing yourself for your sins, eternity in hell. Hell's real. In Revelations 14, 10 and 11, an angel speaks about those who will worship the beast. It says that they will drink of the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his, his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Those verses are, are very difficult to read, but they're even more difficult to imagine the Bible calls hell a fiery furnace, a place of burning sulfur, if you would, the outer darkness and a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The truth about hell is, it is real. Yes. You see, God has created a universe with a heaven and a hell. He has told us about both. And as Christians, we must take these truths to heart. We spent, when is the last time that we've spent our whole day or night praying on the behalf of a lost loved one? We have a prayer list, I'm sure. But do we really pray for them? Do, do people come to mind and pray for the lost? You see, hell is real. It is a destination of all who have not received Christ. I'm about to ask a stupid question. Is there anyone in here who wants to go to hell? Do you believe there is really a hell? Yes. So here's a twofold question. 